All right, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Mara Herman, Health Policy Specialist here at the Ecology Center, and I'll be your moderator for today. So, currently all attendees are in listen-only mode. If at any time during the webinar you have a question, please use the chat box to share it. After today's presentation, we'll have time for questions. And please note, today's webinar is being recorded and materials from the presentations will be available tomorrow. So after today's webinar, you should be able to identify chemicals of concern in Michigan fish and adverse health impacts related to consuming fish with higher chemical levels. And we're lucky enough to be joined by Carolyn Cope this afternoon. Carolyn is the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services statewide Eat Safe Fish Program. She works with local, state, and federal agencies to expand the health education and outreach to increase awareness among residents regarding contaminants in fish. Carolyn has a master's in public health from State University of New York Downstate School of Public Health, concentrating in community health sciences, urban and immigrant health. She has a background that spans across coordinating public health programming to support urban food security, as well as the seafood industry, developing and managing community supported fisheries throughout the New York metropolitan area. She moved to Michigan in 2018 to be closer to family, nature, and the Great Lakes, which stole her heart many years ago. And with that, so happy to introduce and turn over to Carolyn for her presentation. Hi, thank you, Mara, for the introduction. Let me um, share my screen here and get to my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that for waiting. Um, thank you for the introduction, Ma. So East Bay Fish is um, the branded name for the Michigan Fish Consumption Advisory Program. It is part of the Environmental Health Division of, um, at MDHHS. The program evaluates levels of chemicals in Michigan sport, sport caught fish, um, then it issues those health advisories. And where I come into play is I work with our toxicologist um, to communicate those health-based health information to the public so we all can have um, a better knowledge than to make informed decisions when choosing fish to eat. So there are, in my opinion, many reasons to eat fish. Um, in general, Eating fish supports numerous nutritional needs, such as um, it's a lean source of protein, low in saturated fat. Um, I'm sure you've heard that some fish are very high in omega-3 fatty acids, and that supports reduction in inflammation and lowering of, uh, blood pressure. It's also great for babies, as it facilitates um, brain development. And if you are a uh, pregnant woman or are breastfeeding, you can pass along um, all of those nutritional benefits to your baby in utero or through your um, breast milk. So choosing fish um, higher in omega-3 such as wild salmon or sardines or Great Lakes trout is good for that. Also, um, catching, preparing, and eating fish boasts economic benefits. Um, subsidence fishing, uh, a real survival mechanism to feed yourself, your family, and community if you need. Uh, locally caught fish can also be a sustainable choice. With pole caught um, fish, there's a low negative impact to the environment opposed to, for example, trawling, which can damage the floor habitat and um, pick up non-targeted species in its path. And then finally, for some groups, um, Fishing and uh, eating fish is part of a cultural, traditional, and religious act. So it can boast and pass down ecological knowledge, um, customs, traditions, really cultural flourishing around um, harvesting and preparing and eating fish. And then I would like to add that um, fishing can be fun and perhaps therapeutic for some. And we live in Michigan, so there's plenty of opportunity for fishing. So you know of the many benefits of eating fish. However, there are some um, risks to consider. And it really is 
of like a fine dance. Um, while we encourage eating fish because of all those benefits, we also address the health risk and then balance the two. Um, risks come from chemicals found in the environment, which end up in our aquatic ecosystems, fish. And it's not new. Um, chemicals in our water bodies have been around for quite a while. So I'll touch base on um, the chemical list here, but only some are more prevalent in Michigan and which are trigger our fish advisories um, these days. <laughs> but the history of our advisory program really starts um, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, with mercury from the coal industry being the first advisory issued in 1970. I believe it was in the late 60s that there was a known presence of the chemical and the health risk, so therefore a um, fish advisory was issued. Following mercury in the 1970s um, was PCBs in DDT. PCBs found in hydraulic oils um, used in electrical equipment like transformers, and that was banned in the 1970s. And then DDT as one of the first modern, modern insecticides, which was also banned in the 70s. Then we have dioxin and PBB. Um, PBB is a fire retardant. Um, it was also uh, tied to a historic um, incident in Michigan from the Michigan Chemo Up, Chemical Up Company. Then we have dioxin, um, which is created or which is created when chlorine chemicals are used and can be released through industrial incineration practices, also poorly managed waste sites, and then intentional dumping. Toxaphene. Toxaphene is another insecticide. Um, sometimes it was added to lakes and rivers to kill unwanted fish, and that has also been banned. I believe that was in the 90s that was banned. Um, selenium is a natural element for our bodies to function, but too much can be harmful, and that has come from mining practices. And then most recently, uh, we have the PFOS, which is from a group of chemicals, PFAS, um, this group of chemicals are resistant to heat, um, water, oil, and they're, they were used in industry that makes things like waterproof clothing, so your Gore-Tex boots or your rainproof jackets, um, firefighting foam, some cleaning pro products, and then things like your Teflon pans, Scotch guard. Um, they're rarely used in the U.S. today, but it is what it is an emerging chemical, so we are um, testing for it more and learning more about it, but not all is uncovered yet. So these chemicals um, are persistent, which is a big problem because they stick around in our environment and don't break down as fast as we would like them to. A lot of these chemicals in fish today are due to past industrial waste management practices like in the 70s. Um, so while some chemicals were banned from use back then, like PCBs, for example, and we now have more pollution co control regulations put in place, these chemicals are still in our environment and still pose a problem now. Um, while we're seeing about the same amount, if not more, mercury being released into our atmosphere, primarily from the coal fire power plants around the world, which travels around the earth and lands in our water, thus adding to the amount of mercury that we're seeing in Great Lakes Basin. So it's not just a Michigan issue, it is a world, worldwide issue. The other issues that um, these chemicals, we see in these chemicals is that they are bioaccumulative. So they actually build up in fish, increasing in amounts as you move up the food chain. This is why older fish, um, larger fish, in particular fish that eat other fish, so predator fish, for example, catfish, um, tend to have higher amounts of these chemicals than smaller fish. So like, for example, catfish or um, carp would have higher amounts than panfish, like bluegill, typically.
Um, unfortunately, this issue does not end um, when a fish is caught and killed. Uh, whether you're purchasing fish for yourself um, to take home and cook, or you are fishing and catching your fish that way, these biocumulative and persistent chemicals in a fish end up on our plates too. And then as fish eaters, such as myself, um, these chemicals can bioaccumulate in us as well over time. Why is this a problem? Um, well, when you're dealing with a chemical like mercury, once you get it, it can take up to around 10 months for your body to cycle it out and to return to average levels that, that are found in most populations. However, then there are other chemicals such as PCBs um, that take longer to, for your body to process um, and to get back to a normal level found in general population. So that's more like 50 years. Now, um, exposure to these chemicals can cause various health problems, um, but it's really not so linear, so it's kind of complex. Um, you will not get sick right away. You know, I won't eat my double portion of Great Lakes trout tonight and tomorrow wake up diagnosed with a disease or feeling sick. Um, plus, there is no way to know that present or future health issues were caused by these chemicals um, that we're eating in fish. So your risk of health problems is really determined by a few things. Um, I like to use an example of lock and keys. So your DNA is like a bunch of little locks and these chemicals carry keys. So there isn't really a good way to know which keys are going to fit in which locks and when um, it could possibly unlock some health issues. So the determinants are the amount of exposure, meaning how much and how often you're exposed to these chemicals. Are you choosing fish with higher or lower contamination? And then are you preparing that fish in a way that reduces some of those chemicals? And I'll get to more on that later. Um, how often are you eating fish? Are you someone that eats fish once a year, uh, once a month, twice a month, twice a week, every day, every meal? And then how much are you eating? Are, is it the whole fish that you're eating or is your eight ounce portion um, really close, more like 13 ounces? So those are um, some factors. But also other factors are who you are, your age, your health, um, even your genetics. So some of these factors can be controlled while some cannot. In general, you can control you know, the type of fish that you eat, how often, how much, how it's prepared, which will help limit your exposure to some of these chemicals in fish. Um, but who you are, not so much. You can't really change your age, although you might want to. That's a personal opinion. But um, so these factors kind of play, come into play. Um, like I said before, there's not really a good way to know if your existing or future um, health issues were caused by these chemicals. There have been studies um, that correlate exposure to these chemicals to various health effects we would, that we want to protect against, but um, not too many people are willing to subject themselves to exposure to these chemicals willingly so that we can confirm if these chemicals actually do cause specific um, adverse health effects. So what we can do is rely on the best science that we that is available and then go from there. Um, here are some of the correlated health effects. This is just an overview of health effects to the common chemicals found in Michigan today. Um, there are other chemicals uh, mentioned, like the ones at the beginning, of the presentation and they all can be found in our Eat Safe Fish guides in detail. <clears throat> so you will notice some of the health effects uh, span across chemical categories such as harm to the brain development or thyroid functions, um, fertility issues. 
We used to worry about mercury primarily for um, children and pregnant women, but new studies have shown that it can actually affect heart function. So we expanded the, the guidelines to cover anyone with a heart. <laughs> um, additionally, some studies have shown that certain types of uh, PCOS can harm fertility and change the immune system and increase high blood pressure in, in pregnant women. And again, it's not that um, I will wake up with cancer the next day after I eat too much fish, but these are things that can um, develop in your, in your body over time. So that was a lot of negative information, um, I know, but it is important to remember that despite all this, fish do have a lot of health benefits to them that we touched on, um, all those vitamins and minerals and lean protein, and it really is a balance of risk and benefits. And some fish are better choices than others. Um, so before jumping into the tools to help us make these choices, I just want to point out that our guidelines and all of our materials are set to be safe for everyone. So they're safe for pregnant women, breastfed infants, children, people who have um, chronic diseases. Um, so we call that the more sensitive, the more sensitive population. So does this mean that if you are not part of that sensitive population, you are free to eat as much fish as you want? Um, absolutely. Of course, even if you are part of these categories, you can still eat as much fish as you want. It's your choice. Um, these are not regulatory guidelines. Um, I think sometimes there might be some confusion. Uh, perhaps folks get us confused with uh, the DNR um, and their fishing um, regulations, but this is not, this is different. This is health-based. Um, they're simply tools to help you make the best choice for yourself based on what you think is an accept acceptable risk for yourself and um, your family. Uh, with that in mind, our audience for fish consumption guidelines are people who eat a lot of fish, like me, um, people who don't eat a lot of fish but live in historically contaminated areas, such as um, this photo here. This photo, you can't, I don't think you can see um, this, the town name because of the camera, but it is um, St. Louis and this is the Pine River that runs through the area. Um, it is a, uh, an area of pretty harsh legacy contamination, uh, DDT. So, this portion of the river is do not eat. People who have pre-existing health conditions um, or are pregnant, planning to have kids in the near future, and this actually affects men too because there are fertility issues associated, associated with some of these chemicals, um, breastfed infants, and then of course, kids themselves. So I put this, I took this photo, I put this um, photo in here because I think it's important. Um, this photo, uh, this, like I said, this is St. Louis and this is the Pine River. And every summer they put, the community puts on a fishing derby for everyone, for kids to enjoy. And there are a lot of prizes, free prizes, and then um, there's lots of food, it's free. So while this community is still impacted by this, legacy contamination, they still value this uh, natural resource and it, this resource still brings them together to enjoy um, and to have that connectivity. So I think, it's, I think it's just important that they do that. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do it this year um, due to social distancing, but hopefully next year it can get back uh, to normal. And I should note that they do not eat the fish that they catch. They just uh, weigh them and measure them and then throw them back. <laughs> so as I mentioned, we have a variety of tools to make it easy for people to choose safer fish to eat. Um, and I think these are fun because these are our brochures in the past to our current brochures on how they have changed. Our current brochures are the um, two on the right. 
um, I personally like the one in the middle, which is an older version because I like Michigan landscapes, but teach his own. Um, so our state white brochure, which is the blue one, covers um, just some basic information about fish consumption that we've gone over so far, um, bioaccumulative and persistent chemicals, um, and then ways to like clean fish to reduce chemical contamination, which we'll get into. Uh, it's really a gateway to more knowledge and um, to go visit our website to learn more or to, um, if you're fishing, to look at our guides. We also have our buy safe brochure um, because we're not all anglers, uh, not everyone is fishing and eating their fresh local catch. So this brochure is meant for when you purchase fish from a grocery store or um, when you're dining out at a restaurant and ordering fish. Um, it's a really great tool. Buy Safe Fish is based off of FDA guidelines for mercury. So it's just mercury based. Um, because mercury, like I said, is a worldwide problem, one that also affects ocean fish in addition to our freshwater fish. Um, so what we did was that using the FDA test for mercury in fish, we came up with this useful um, weight system called EAT8. The idea behind EAT8 point system is that you don't want to go over eight points a month. So a point is a serving size for an adult, eight ounces is usually the serving size and that about the size of your hand. So if you're someone like me who loves anchovies and mullet and oysters and whitefish, um, I'm pretty lucky because that's all in the green box. So I can eat a lot of that. I can eat twice a week from the green box for a month. However, I also really love mackerel. So if I'm going to splurge on mackerel, then that's my eight points for the month. And then I should wait a while for my body to process that mercury, uh, usually about a month. And you'll notice the Michigan stamp on some of these freshwater fish, like, like perch or whitefish. Um, this is because it's guiding you to look at our Eat Safe Fish Guides rather than this. If you're uh, purchasing local, locally caught fish from a store, you know, so for example, I buy whitefish and um, Great Lakes trout at the farmer's market on most weekends. So I would look at our guidelines for Lake Michigan rather than use this because I know those fish were caught out of Lake Michigan. So getting into our guides, I think it's fun to see our, our vintage versions. Um, and here is the one before it was, before the program was rebranded into Eat Safe Fish. Uh, the main difference is, are that is that um, it's broken down into categories of the general population and then women and children. So we have two separate guidelines for those populations. And also it um, is just different with all of these symbols and you have to revert to the key to know how much you're supposed to eat. Um, so it's a little bit different than what we have now. Apparently during that time, the question was asked, uh, when we were thinking of rebranding, they did a survey um, on uh, many anglers. So the question was asked that, why is, it a, why is it okay for men to eat fish that their wives or children can't? And it was a pretty good question. Um, so when we were doing the rebranding back then, the team evaluated, um, science and advances in knowledge that have taken place over the past 20 years and develop this our new program. So our fish consumption guidelines now um, do not break the population down. That's just it covers the entire population. Everyone has the same the same guide. <clears throat> and it is more conservative. Um, they're more restrictive than what some other state fish advisories use, like maybe Wisconsin or Illinois, but they are meant to protect public health, um, which means they're set to be protective for the most susceptible among us. 
on a like fun aesthetic note, um, it was pointed out, the English point in the survey pointed out that why on earth would you put all these photos of people in white wearing white? You don't wear white when you fish because you don't want to get all that slop all over you. So I thought that was really fun and interesting and a, a really good point. <laughs> This is our, our newer Eat Safe Fish Guides. Um, no longer, no more images of improper angler attire. Um, the main differences here is that it is available online. So you can go to our website and um, print out pages from it if you would like. Or you can also download it on your smartphone. So if you're actually like, out fishing and you, you can go to the website and then download it to your phone and look at the guides there. We also have free print copies that are available and you can get those whenever you like um, by going online and requesting them. This guide um, also is different because rather than being broken down in Great Lakes watershed, it's broken down by regions, the five regions, the UP, the Northeast, the Northwest, the Southwest, and the Southeast. Um, so you can easily locate your county and your water body in these regions, so which is especially helpful if you're traveling and fishing. Inside um, the guides and how to use them, it's pretty simple. We've broken them down into counties and then list all the lakes and rivers that have been tested, that we've tested fish from in alphabetical order. We've also included a map so you can get an idea of water bodies that may have been tested near you. So if you wanted to jump over to a different water body that might have better, um, less restrictive guidelines and safer fish to eat, you can do that. So you'll notice some interesting um, things here that I'm going to go over, like my servings, the little 2x there, and then some special categories like do not eat and limited. We also have the little green fish, which is our best choice stamp. It indicates the best option for that water body. It's really just a quick reference to know what you can safely eat um, more of which I think is helpful for when you're targeting species for substance fishing, which is a quick reference. All right, so the first is um, my serving. <clears throat> my serving is based on body weight. Um, a lot of people use the term meals in other guides, but the problem with that is that it can mean wildly different things to different people. So we created the my serving to help give an estimate that you, what you're actually eating. Um, again, it's based on body weight. So you can customize your my serving using um, the chart over here uh, um, in your own body weight. But on average, for a quick reference, um, for an adult, a serving will be about eight ounces of fish. And again, for a quick reference, you can use your, your hand. Eight ounces of fish is about the size of your hand for an adult. And then for kids, we say around four ounces of fish would be the size of the palm of your hand um, of an adult. Um, the other things you might have noticed is our special categories, which is do not eat and limited. Limited is kind of like a do not eat, but you have a little bit of wiggle room depending on who you are. So, for limited categories, um, you can, it's safe to eat, we say it's safe to eat usually once or twice a year if you do not fall into that sensitive category. So if you are under the age 15, um, don't have health problems, are not planning to have children or are pregnant or breastfeeding, if you're just a healthy adult, um, then we say that it's generally okay to eat the species that with a limited guideline once or twice a year. Again, it's almost like a do not eat. Um, we say the designation of do not eat for fish that are highly contaminated and do not and are not safe to eat because one serving probably um, would have more chemicals that are safe to eat in a year. So this is meant for everyone, um, not just women and children. Um, our other tool we have is this little 
2x symbol. And this is my favorite one because that means you can eat more fish. Um, if you follow certain methods, which are our three C's methods. Um, so if you see a, if you see in a guide a species with the, the 2x, that means that if you follow um, specific cleaning and cooking methods, methods that reduce the fat, you can double your fish portion. So instead of one serving per month, you can have two servings per month. Um, so these are designated for PCBs and or PCBs and dachshunds, because those chemicals tend to hide in the fat of fish. So when you're cleaning your fish, if you remove the fat, which typically means removing the belly fat, um, and if you remove the skin, um, and then you cook it in a way that the fat is dripping away, so grilling and broiling are the best, best methods for that, you're reducing the, um, the amount of chemicals in that, in that fish. If you are a crispy skin person like me, um, and you don't typically remove the skin and don't want to, you can also um, poke holes in the fish. It sounds kind of weird, but um, you can poke holes in the fish so then um, there's more opportunity for the fat to be released. By doing this, you can um, reduce the chemicals contamination by around half, and that's why you can um, increase your fish cons consumption on species with the 2X. Now, this doesn't apply to um, limited or genetic categories. It also doesn't apply to um, mercury or PFAS because those chemicals are throughout the, the entire filet of the fish, not just the fat. So if you're using our guidelines um, and you can't locate your uh, lake or river in your county, or you found your lake or river, but the species that you caught or are targeting is not listed um, in that table, is because that not all area water bodies or species are listed. Um, Michigan is blessed with an abundance of fresh water and fish, so we can't possibly test them all every year. This is why we publish a general statewide guideline for areas and species that haven't been tested. Um, this is also found in our guide. So these general guidelines are based off of what essentially statewide averages of mercury and sometimes PCBs. Uh, because mercury, uh, we know that mercury is a worldwide issue. It's in our air, it's in our rain. Therefore, all lakes and rivers in Michigan and the US and the world are going to have some amount of mercury in them. The estimate is, um, the estimate in our statewide guidelines are a little bit conservative. There are lakes and rivers where we've tested fish fillets and found that you can eat more, but since we aren't 100% sure about all the places, um, we took the general average, which tends to be a little bit more conservative. So I get asked this question a lot. Um, how are the guides created? Um, and having been part of the filleting process before, I can tell you that it's a little different than going to your fishmonger and um, getting fish broken down for you to take home or catching and cleaning fish yourself. So the first step to this is procuring and processing the fish. Uh, fish collection usually is around spring, summer, and sometimes going into fall, depending on time and how busy we are. <clears throat> so first, um, MDHHS partners with Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, Eagle, and uh, Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the DNR, to have fish collected for testing. Uh, the toxicologists will request certain types of fish or certain types of species from a variety of water bodies. Often carp is requested, even though it's not the most popular fish to eat, but they tend to have a lot of chemicals because of what they do eat. And so they are pretty good indicators of other fish that should be tested from a water body. 
The fish are um, then taken back to the Eagle, Air, the Eagle Warehouse where they are measured, weighed, and then filleted um, the way you would if you're eating fish at home. So for example, if the skin is typically removed um, before eating fish, then we will remove the skin um, in this process too. I should note that only the fillets are tested. Um, we don't test the whole fish. So after that, the fillets are wrapped and frozen for storage until it's time for the MDHHS laboratory analysis. Um, freezing and storing the fish does not affect chemicals in fish. So the second step is a lab analysis. And this usually happens during the winter. Um, <clears throat> so for this process, each fillet is ground down to like fish meal, which is that picture on the left with the jars. Um, and each fillet is ground down individually and tested for a lot of different bioaccumulative chemicals. Again, the most common chemicals that we find at levels that are high enough to trigger an advisory are uh, mercury, dioxins, PCBs, and now PFAS. So depending on, we'll test for other chemicals, um, depending on where the fish is from and what might be found in that area. So if there was a contamination event, then we know that we should probably go there and test the species. Um, the next step is reviewing and updating the guidelines. And this happens in the spring. So the whole process takes a, uh, about a year, sometimes longer, depending on how busy the lab is. Um, so in this process, the Eagle Aquatic Biologists and then our toxicologists will work together to review the test results and then update the Eat Safe Fish Guides with the new information. Um, the guidelines don't generally change that much, so your favorite fishing spot won't necessarily change um, year to year or with each new published guideline. Um, since these chemicals are persistent, they're in our environment for a while, breaking down very slowly, so we don't expect much change from a year to year basis. We generally retest water bodies every five to ten years on a rotating cycle unless a contamination event occurred. Um, so we make very few changes to the guidelines each year. However, that has been, uh, with PFAS, that has been changing. <clears throat> um, so we put our, although we only publish our guides once a year or, ev or every other year, we do put updated um, PFAS information on a PFAS response site. Um, and also on our website as well. So um, with that being said, you can always pull up our most current guides online to see if any changes have happened to your favorite fishing uh, location. And um, the Eat Safe Fish Guide can still be a good source um, for you to choose safer, safer fish, even if the data is a, a few years old. So if you are interested in seeing the science um, and the methodology behind our guides, we share all that information online. It's under our Reports and Sciences tab. Um, at the Re Reports and Sciences page, you can download the um, Fish Consumption Guidelines guidance document, which is a handbook. Um, it's, yeah, so it's a, like a handbook when setting the fish consumption guidelines. It's not something that I refer to um, very often, but if you would like to see that uh, mythology, it is there for you. You can also download all the data and recommendation sheets. Um, these sheets show that the, what these sheets show the fish that have been tested, and then how we specifically calculated each guideline listed in the Eat Safe Fish Guides. Um, there, there are many graphs to go through. This is something that I do use um, when looking at new uh, guidelines and updated information. 
So all of that, if you're interested, um, information is on our website. It is a process that is tr transparent. So with that, again, we put out our Eat Safe Fish Guide so you know what you're eating and are aware of how much is actually recommended. It's essentially a nutritional label like you'd see at a grocery store, only that we can't put stickers on all the fish. Um, so you can choose to use it or you can not use it, but at least you know it's there, it's available for you. And with that, feel free to reach out to me if you would like to get a guide or any of our information in the mail, if you are through your work or if you're associated, connected to any organizations um, or activities where you think this information would be important for your community, um, please again, feel free to reach out to me. I can send out any information that you would like of our materials and any quantity um, and can be an in-person resource as well. My contact information is on on the screen and our um, website's up there as well. Great, thank you so much, Carolyn. And we have had a lot of questions already come in. Um, oh. And if folks have questions, please be sure to chat those out. Um, but Carolyn, first question that um, folks, it's been brought up a couple of times is asking about when you refer to a regular amount of mercury. Um, when, you went, when you were discussing regular amounts of mercury, um, the average level that people have in their bodies already or what people should have. Um, could you kind of uh, decipher that for us? Oh, there are statewide guidelines. I see. Um, so since mercury is, is a world, worldwide problem, it's everywhere. It's, it's going to be in all the fish. Um, within this the, the average level of mercury, not the average level that's already in our bodies, is the average that is, is found in our environment, if that makes sense. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then we had a couple questions come through regarding the EAT-8 um, and the serving size for that. Was that specifically referring to eight ounces of fish as well? Yes, I can go back to that page if you would like. Let me find out where it was. Oops, I'm sorry. You get to see the entire slideshow again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The question was again, Specifically asking about um, eat eight and is this pertaining to eight ounces of fish in the survey? Yes. So if you are an adult, um, that would be pertaining to eight ounces of fish in a serving, so the size of your hand. Um, if you are a child, if you're a kid, that would be pertaining to um, four ounces, which is again like the size of your palm, an adult's palm. So the point is the serving size, which is for an adult, eight ounces, for a kid, four ounces, depending on what you are. And then to follow up, um, there was a question specifically regarding tiny sardines. I see that sardines is on this list. Yeah. Um, does that also mean for tiny sardines as well? For tiny, tiny sardines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I've never had that question before. That's a really great question because I eat a lot of sardines. Um, yes. <laughs> Great. And um, another question that came through is, so is it easier to eat farmed fish or wild fish? Um, specifically because it seems like eating farmed fish where the farm uses non-toxic water or feed would be safer. Um, and also how do you find out information like this from other states? That is a really good question. Um, I don't get that question very often with the um, farm fish versus wild fish and contamination. So if you are, it kind of goes back to, in one way it goes back to like knowing where you're purchasing your fish from. 
So if you're purchasing farm fish, knowing a little bit more information about that farm, um, stockpiling the farm, where was the fish originally from? Or, and then there is gonna be a little bit of, I, I would say that if you're eating farm fish that was from a local farm in Michigan, then you could use our statewide guidelines because we would refer to that as well because since the area, the water is, uh, in a fish farm, the water is not connected to any other water bodies. Um, we wouldn't have necessarily have a problem with um, industrial chemicals in that point unless there was an event that happened. So you would refer to your statewide guidelines for that, um, as well as private ponds. Um, another question that came through um, was regarding history of major water pollution sources. Um, mm -hmm. Do you by any chance know, in fact, maybe you have some insight on this as well, um, about history of this being taught in public school? Um, I do not. I do not know. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. I think it should um, be taught in schools. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure in terms of it actually being taught in schools and, and being part of the curriculum. I know there was some campaigns back in the 90s um, by Ecology Center and others to do a lot of public education about fish contamination. Um, and a lot of that did engage, you know, families and, and children, but I actually am not clear on the, the curriculum side of it. Also regarding curriculum, Carolyn, do you know if any of the materials from the East Bay Fish Program are shared in school? Um, they are, in some capacity. Um, so part of our community engagement and outreach, we do, we will if, go to schools and do a presentation. We do have um, a specific like kids related presentation that we do at water festivals which um, a lot of the schools attend and we give presentations to kids there and we're also always open to send our materials out to um, educators health care facilities and we're open to going and being a physical um, resource as well <clears throat> and i would I don't think I answered a question completely. Um, I believe someone had asked, how do you find other states' guidelines? Mm -hmm. And you can just simply like Google um, Indiana Fish Advisory Program, and it'll take you directly, or it'll take you to like their website. It's usually put on by like the health department. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. Those are all the questions that we have. Um, so again, thank you so much for sharing all this information and taking the time to join us today. Um, if you're, you're more than welcome to stay on, um, but now we are going to transition. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for everyone tuning in. All right, so everyone should be able to see my screen now to talk about a little bit about different actions that can be taken or are being taken here in Michigan. Um, so first, just to kick off that, um, like a lot of the information that Carolyn shared around the East Bay Fish Program, um, here at the Ecology Center, we are also a proponent of consuming healthy fish. So um, we've been involved in work in a couple of different ways, um, specifically around ensuring that the state of Michigan has consumption advisory um, and continuing to work to ensure that um, there's reduced pollution in the Great Lakes and ensuring there's a safe food supply. Um, one of the ways that we have done this work is around um, closing waste incinerators. So uh, the Ecology Center has been involved in the work here in Michigan to help shut down um, 157 medical waste incinerators that were in the state. Um, another big campaign that was the Ecology Center was a part of was a Breeze Free Detroit that helped to shut down Detroit's municipal waste incinerator. And then there's also some state level actions. Um, I'm going to turn over to Becca to talk a little bit about the work regarding PFAS. Yeah, so we heard a little bit about one of the chemicals, POFS, 
um, that is that is in the guidelines in terms of eat safe fish. Um, but what we know is that that um, and there is a webinar on our website, and we can share that with you if you want to watch the updated version of that. And the state has many resources too. That that is just one of a class of chemicals called PFAS, P-A-F-S. And so the state of Michigan has been looking to address. Um, these chemicals in all kinds of different environments where we may encounter them. So we're focused on fish today, um, but they end up coming out of various industrial processes and products, um, everything, um, and Carolyn mentioned some of this, everything from our Teflon pans to firefighting foam and things like that. Um, or for example, some of the um, do not eat the fish advisory contamination in Michigan came from firefighting foam up in the Oscoda area in Clark's Marsh and the Osable River um, in the Huron River um, right where we are in Ann Arbor um, where the Ecology Center is based we have some contamination coming from tri-bar manufacturing from chrome plating on plastics for the auto industry so we will continue to watch both sort of the ongoing use of these chemicals and um, work with the state and monitor what's happening with others. Uh, Ecology Center, along with many other partners, paying for drinking water standards as well. So from moving to fish to um, the water that, that they live in, um, if it's the drinking water that we source here in Ann Arbor from the Huron River, um, or maybe groundwater that's um, well, you know, that's serving a lot of different other uh, areas of the state. Um, the state is considering uh, drinking water contamination uh, levels for P seven different PFAS or called a maximum contaminant level. Um, and so the, I'm not going to go into all the details and list there. Um, there are some of these that were, we felt like were good steps in the right direction at the Ecology Center and others from our perspective, again, as an organization focused on human health that we think should be stronger. And we hope that, you know, as the state moves forward, um, and these standards hopefully will be finalized soon. Um, there, as new evidence comes and new science comes out, we can make them even more health protective um, for the most vulnerable populations. So if we think of the correlation between how much fish you can eat um, if you are an adult versus a child versus a pregnant woman, something along those lines, thinking of it in, the same, in a similar way um, with drinking water in that you know, there are levels that may, may be much more harmful to a baby or a developing fetus or a pregnant um, woman than they might be to uh, an otherwise healthy adult that has no necessarily no other um, immune system issues or things along those lines. Uh -huh. Mara, I think you have the slides. I was going to forward and that doesn't work. <laughs> so there are a number of other policy proposals on PFAS that we're looking at. Um, there is a take back program and this actually is breaking news. Um, this has moved through the Senate, this bill HB 4389 um, to, it came out of the House in the state legislature, it's moved through the Senate, the House concurred a bill and so, and this is as of like a few days ago, maybe even yesterday. Um, so we're hopeful that this, the governor will sign this. The take back program for PFAS containing firefighting foams essentially is underway and well underway right now. Um, there is a system that's been created. There was funding for this program and over 30,000 gallons of this PFAS containing um, firefighting foam, often called aqueous film forming foam or AFFF, has been collected from fire departments across the state. Um, so we're very happy about this. Um, we do feel like there needs to be additional action taken um, to stop the what remaining uses there are in PFAS um, containing firefighting foams. And so we have different strategies working at uh, with partners at the national level um, to change the military specification um, so that AFFF, so PFAS doesn't have to be um, in the military spec, which could help us in places like military bases um, to make sure that um, airports like our Detroit airport don't have to use PFAS should they choose not to. Um, and then hopefully uh, slamming the door on it by passing some good legislation that is passed in other states to ban the use of these chemicals because there are not only effective alternatives out there um, that can be used, but there are also um, those that have also recently got a green screen certification that are found are shown to be more environmentally preferable. So they don't contain nasty PFAS chemicals, and they also um, don't contain any, any other nasty substitutes. 
So that's important. Um, a lot of our things that we're calling for uh, in the legislature are related to funding to continue to test different environmental media, be it fish or water or foam um, or bio sludge, things like that for PFAS chemicals um, to see how, how extensive this problem is and to be able to address it. And Michigan has done a really excellent job in testing various different environments um, and animals and things like that for PFAS. And so we applaud the state on that and we want to ensure that funding continues because this problem, unfortunately, uh, isn't over. So we, we're still in the midst of it for a bit. Um, we also know that there will need to be some funds shared with um, both water utilities and private well users to provide safe drinking water. And this burden of funding should really come from those who are responsible, so the companies making and using the PFAS chemicals in the end. So ensuring that the polluters are paying for that. So that's something that we're advocating for, so that you and I as taxpayers, as ratepayers, aren't necessarily shouldering all of this burden um, ourselves when we didn't create the problem in the first place. So we know we need to have safe drinking water standards, we need to move those forward, and we want to make sure the people who actually polluted are paying to remediate the problem. Um, one of the things that's come out of many conversations we've had with friends in impacted communities by PFAS contamination is the need to actually do medical monitoring and to follow those communities to do testing for those chemicals in their blood and their bodies. Um, over a long period of time to find out if there are any clusters, any health impacts that show up in communities um, that are more common than they are uh, in the, the general population. So that's something else we're calling for. Um, and then uh, I think I'll, I'll, you can read the rest of them, but I'll pause there. Um, do we have another slide? Yeah, do you have yours? Sure. Um, yeah. And so on the other side of things, um, Carolyn mentioned in her presentation, mercury is a huge um, chemical of concern and that cold fire power plants are the largest contributor to mercury emissions into our air, water, and soil. So one way to ensure less mercury gets into our fish that we are consuming is to ensure that um, it's not being emitted at all. So um, one way to do that is to transition to cleaner sources of energy. Um, so as you can see on here, Public Act 341 and 342 were passed here in Michigan a few years ago that um, requires an increase to our renewable energy standard. It went from 10 to 15 percent um, and to ensure that we are increasing our use of renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, so uh, that can be done through support of stronger energy legislation. So increasing use of renewable energy sources like wind and solar decreases our reliance on fossil fuels including coal. Um, and energy efficiency, also referred to as energy optimization or energy waste reduction, refers to steps taken to reduce energy waste. Um, energy efficiency benefits us all, whether it's a homeowner updating an old inefficient appliance, a hospital installing a new LED system, or adding insulation to a building, the cleanest and cheapest energy is the energy that we don't use. Um, so with that, that brings us to the end of today's presentation and webinar. Um, I will be chatting out the evaluation link. Um, this is required for all health, current Health Leaders Fellows. However, um, we also strongly encourage all other participants to complete the survey as well, as your feedback is really valuable and helpful in us um, planning future meetings and events. Um, and speaking of future meetings and events, um, our next series of webinars will be kicking off at the end of the summer. Um, so we will be starting our air, climate, and energy webinar series in late August. Um, the first webinar in that series will be covering uh, health impacts of climate change and will be joined by Jessica Wolf, U.S. Director of Climate and Health for Healthcare Without Harm. And more details will be coming about that webinar series and this webinar specifically, but for now, I am chatting out that link as well. If folks want to just be able to get that on their calendar and register. Um, as a quick reminder, materials from today's webinar will be made available tomorrow. We'll be sending those out via email. Um, I can also mention that we do have our YouTube channel where you can go back and watch um, former webinars within the Toxic Chemicals and Health series. Um, and with that, we are going to close today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care and stay safe.